beautiful day. A little different than last week. Last week we were a little cooler. So, uh, beautiful day. I was looking through the announcements. I didn't bring them up here with me, but is there anything that needs to be added to the bulletin? Any stick that's changed since it was printed? Okay. Very good. Very good. Well, Bob, do you mind to lead us in a prayer, Bob, before we begin? Well, if you would, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. That's where we will pick up. Just as a brief reminder of where we're at in Ephesians, um, the first three chapters were Paul's teaching to the Ephesian brethren of the blessings that they had. Those blessings which they had been physically rich, but literally, probably, their spiritual bank accounts were rather poor. New to being Christians, most of them Gentile, they didn't realize what they really had. And so therefore, the time that he spent with them, he endeared them closely, and he writes this letter to them to remind them of the many, many blessings that they had in Christ. And you'll recall chapter 1, first and foremost, they were chosen. Chosen of the Heavenly Father, redeemed by the Son sealed by the Spirit. And as he goes on into that chapter, the prayers that he offered for them. And he continued on, chapter 2, the grace that's given, it's a blessing. And he continues on in the blessings that we have in Christ. And he prayed that they would realize that. He prayed that they would come to knowing those things. And so, as he gets into chapter 4 then, those blessings weren't just simply blessings not to be enacted upon, but now we get in from chapter 4, 5, and 6, then the latter half of the book, the duties we have to use those blessings. Chief among them, as he mentioned, the the blessing of the gifts that we have to be used to the edifying of the saints. That after being one of the very first things that he calls people, I'm sorry, Christians to do, was first thing that he called for in chapter 4 is to be unified. Unified together. He called for oneness. And he explained what that was. It was very simple. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. So that oneness he calls them to do and to use their gifts and their talents together to grow. Verse 16 of chapter 4. And as we talked about last week, a call to holiness and purity Being separate from the world, we're not of the world any longer, but put that old man off and put on the new man of Christ. And as he mentioned, for those that stole, steal no more, use yourself to the benefit of others, making use of yourself. And so we ended with verse 30, and grieving not the Holy Spirit, and as we talked about that last week, was anything that we change in the Word of God, this truth that he's given us, anything that we change then we grieve that Holy Spirit that inspired that for us. And we got to verse 5, I'm sorry, chapter 5. It is a continuation, though. You know, there's no chapter markers in the books as we have them. We simply have them there for our convenience so we can find things. If you're like me, the older you get, the more you lose, and the more you need help finding things. So that's what these marks are for, is for us to find these things. It's a continuation of chapter 4. And it's basically a continuation of grieve not that Holy Spirit. Don't change what we have been given. So he starts off in verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, 
and hath given himself an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor, but fornication and all uncleanliness or covetousness. Let it not be once named among you as becometh the saints, neither filthiness nor foolish je- talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know that no whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now ye are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is all goodness, and righteousness, and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. I'm going to go through verse 17. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. So let's go back to verse 1. And then he again, And be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love. So that's something that he's mentioned already a couple of different times. The walk that we have is a walk here, as he specifies. He wants it to be walk in love. And he's mentioned love before in the book. Uh, it's not a foreign uh, idea that he brings up here. He's been re, re going over this over and over again. Um, many of these things he said at least once, twice, sometimes up to three times here. But he's, he's, he's been mentioning this. And walk in love. I didn't look in the Greek, but I anticipate that this love would have been the agape love, I would expect, because he references as Christ also hath loved us. So we talk about it. I think we know what it is, agape love. But I'll ask, what is agape love? love that God has for us. How is it different from the other types of love? Brotherly love? Right. Erotic. Right. And then, skorika is another one. The maternal type of love, a little different love. Um, not necessarily brotherly love, but familial. So those are the kinds of love that we have mentioned. But agape, there's a distinct feature that it has different than the other three. Would we sacrifice ourselves in an erotic love for someone else? No, I'm sorry, Janet. Yeah. Mike. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. It, so that dying for us is sacrificial love. So when we have an agape love for one another, that is a sacrificial love. So my sacrifice, my wife, I will sacrifice myself for her. I have a love for her that I, someone comes breaking in the house at night, I, I'm, okay, I may die. That's fine. I'm good with that. But she will be protected. I promise you of that. But I say that to say this. Sacrificial love is a brotherly love. We should sacrifice ourselves for one another. How would we sacrifice ourselves for one another? Not our lives per se, but we may have that opportunity of sacrificing our lives. But how do we sacrifice ourselves for one another? Time. Sure. So time, uh, means, money, Kathy, preference for one another, preferring one another, 
the essence of all that stuff still yet one thing that we recognize those needs we know one another enough that we know one another's needs and then we fill them we do whatever we have to do to fill that that may take me a little time off of work but that's fine i'm going to sacrifice myself and I'm, my brother needs some help and maybe he's been recuperating and needs a yard mode or something simple it's no big deal but that's what we do fill those needs help out that may be time may be means but seeing those things and recognizing them and then responding to them in whatever way it calls for. So, now, I've noticed that a lot of people that are hearing this before, and I've said it to a lot of people, mm -hmm. I think on top of it all is all of our obligations to help each other out spiritually. Mm -hmm. Good word. And you're exactly right, and I was going to go into it. It comes into that same parallel thought later, but we're going to jump into it since you mentioned it. There is always a direct relationship and example uh, of teaching between spiritual and physical. And yes, we're talking physical with the time and means and how we sacrificially love one another of our means physically. But spiritually, how do we do that? Spiritually, that might be sacrificing ourselves spiritually from the standpoint of our brother is in sin and we go to him and we realize that we're helping him. You know, that is not comfortable. It's not something anybody wants to do. But a lot of times that doesn't get done, quite honestly. It may be uncomfortable for us to do that. We may not want to relish the thought of correction and exhortation, admonishment. But if it saves his soul in James chapter 5, we've gained a brother. So there is direct relationships, but that agape love is exactly what God did for us. He sacrificed of his son for us because we were all his enemies. We were sinners, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. We had separated ourselves from him. And so in that, that's the love that he has for us as the heavenly father. And as the son came and sacrificed himself, that's exactly what he did. So there is always that parallel, always. And so very true. But notice what he says, and it brings up another point. And hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Was there ever, and again, I ask because I may get corrected. I got corrected on who was a... Um, I've asked these questions sometimes not realizing myself of was there ever another person that did that? Well, I've been, my wife will bring it up to me, but I'll ask the question here. Was an Old Testament reference of sacrifice ever referenced as being a sweet smelling savor? When? Is it? Okay. Okay, good. The reason I'm asking is because physically you think about the dead sacrifices offered, I wouldn't expect that to be a very sweet-smelling savor. Now, in reference to God accepting that, I've just not, maybe there is, and I'll look and see. I appreciate that. 
But we do know this, that Christ's sacrifice was a sweet-smelling savor. What is a sweet-smelling savor? Yeah, it was acceptable by him. It was pleasing to him. It's what he desired. That sacrifice fulfilled what was required. And for God, this recipient of that, it was like a sweet-smelling savor. Very similar to when we sit down and have our meal. I mean, first thing we notice is, what's it smell like? If it smells like a possum that's been hit on the road and you get it on a platter, are you going to you going to eat that thing? Well, I, some people might. But most, most would probably not, right? So I'm just saying it is our first sense that is satisfied, actually, when we sit down and before we taste. And we may eat with our eyes. We may eat with our nose. It is a smell that's taken in. But Christ's sacrifice was described as a sweet-smelling savor. And then he goes on. But fornication, all uncleanliness, covetousness, let it not be named, I'm sorry, once named, among you as become a saint. Now, last chapter, he called us to holiness. He told, he, he, he exhorts the saints to be holy. Holy is consecrated, set apart. We're not of the world. We don't just go out and live sinful lives and come to church on Sunday morning and expect that we're just fine. That's not the way this works. If we are called out and uh, out of the world, if we've put him on in baptism, then we are separate from the world. We're no longer of the world. And we can't participate in fornication. As we mentioned last work, lasciviousness or unrestrained desires that just go uh, into anything that we want. We can't be undisciplined and just do whatever we want. He says here, uh, covetousness. What's covetousness? We sometimes use this word, sometimes we don't. What is it when you covet? Envy. Envy is something else that you would like to have at whatever means it takes to get it. And you can, there's a lot of things we're going to get into here that we can covet and desire more than we should. Let it not be once named among you. Now, if we're separate and apart from the world, if we're holy and if we're consecrated, if we're not participating in those things, will it be named once among you? It shouldn't be. That's what he's saying here. Let it not once be named among you as becometh saints. Neither, and he goes on, neither filthiness. Well, that's generally we know what that would be, correct? What would be filthiness? He's going into. Yep. So he's going into our talk, our conduct, our general demeanor, our general, you know, persona, if you will, filthiness, uh, foolish talking is one thing that it says here. What what would be foolish talking? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Things that don't matter. If it doesn't matter, or you're looking back. One way of foolish talking is in reference to, I kind of looked at the Greek briefly on this, is looking back and scolding and scoffing people's achievements after they've done them. Right? That's an easy way to look back on very pessimistically, tearing people down when they've done something perhaps good and, and fine. And looking back and foolishly talking about it, being critical where we ought not be critical, nor jesting. What's jesting? We don't talk about jesting very much. Okay, it's the jokes that we tell that are not proper. So when... Yeah, and so we, we know, you know, the um, off-color jokes that get told. Um, in Gallows. fact, what's that? Gallows. Yeah, yeah. You know, 
any more, you know, they use ratings and all this stuff, any more used to it being, oh, it's kind of PG or whatever. Well, they've blown that out of the water if you've been in the workplace for any period of time recently. Our culture is just absolutely filthy with the, it's cavalier just to take, say words that, you know, um, 30 years ago would, would not, not, not be said, absolutely not be said. Uh, but now words are used just very happenstance, very casual. It's so, yes, foolish talking, coarse jesting, the gallows, which are not convenient, but rather give thanks. For this ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, it comes back again to covetous, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance of the kingdom of Christ and of God. It's odd to say, for this ye know no whoremonger. Is he speaking in physical terms here? Oh yeah, don't become prostitutes. Is that what he's telling them? Exactly what he's talking about. It's literally to sell oneself into that trade. Okay, that's what he's talking about. Now, Israel was by many. Uh, okay, so Hosea was instructed to marry who? Hosea the prophet. Gomer. What was Gomer's profession? She was a prostitute. Did he tell her just to marry her because she was a prostitute, or did God have something else in mind? Yes. So there's always been the sim similitude between harlotry, adultery, whoremongering, and our spiritual lives. Again, it comes back to what you mentioned, the carnal, the physical, the spiritual. Well, there's also a, there's a, a historical context in this as well, is that in the, inside the veil worship, there was a lot of, like they had, well, they did. Men, men and women. They did. You know, They did. Aspect of <coughs> when the lower case D gods started pushing their influence into, they did. into Israel and, and what well was the debauchery that, mm -hmm. was, that came along with that. And that the warnings that we get about what seem like simple fleshly desires is implied at least that there's there's something else out there that <coughs> So definitely, Temple of Diana, Artemis, very, very filthy. That's when he's talking about all this filthiness and lasciviousness and this whoremongering is physical. But what was Israel throughout much of her fall was making them likeness to what? Spiritual adultery. You had left your first love. You had gone into a relationship with others who were forbidden. It was very clear from the very get-go. You cannot do these things and expect to be the children of Israel. But they did them. They accepted them. They welcomed them. And so they fell into captivity. And so they fell into the world. And they. Um, so there is that likeness of here, of this, now that you're saints, not giving yourself and 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 allowing yourself to be purchased as a whoremonger and nor unclean person, nor covetousness, you know, in terms of desiring something that you shouldn't be inordinately desiring. Uh, covetousness is, is a very, it, it, it goes into multiple sins, including adultery. Adultery starts with covetousness. Um, then we go into other things that it can cause too not just the adultering act itself. But I say that to say this, and then it does mention the idolater. 
So these are clearly spiritual in terms of those things. Don't, don't, that for this ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance. Now that's a spiritual inheritance. What are we going to inherit? Eternal life. If we're participating in these things in our lives, we will not have that inheritance of the kingdom of Christ and of God. And he says, let no man deceive you with vain words. Well, if people are doing these things and participating in these things, what's the first thing that always comes out? Ah, be happy. Be happy. You deserve to be happy. Don't listen to them. Don't listen to the, that God. You deserve to be happy. And in that the vain words, and it can flow from a pulpit, don't get me wrong. We hear this all day long from every direction. It can be friends, it can be from the pulpit. Vain words that are deceptive in making you think that, oh, I can live in adultery and be just perfectly fine. Oh, yeah. Sounds great, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It is sneaky. Yeah. It, it's, so much of this is to serve self, okay? And as we serve self, we went back to that lasciviousness. There's unrestrained passions, you know, just be happy. Follow whatever. Do whatever. And there's, there's many out there that will vainly teach that that's okay in one shape or form. And I'll just leave it at this very quickly because I don't have time to exp expand on it. But self-affirmation, it's a dangerous thing. And that's what he's coming to, being affirmed that you're okay. What affirms us? What should affirm us, validate us? The Word of God. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, sorry. Well, sure. And the difference here is these are deliberate acts that take us out of that, though. You know what I'm saying? You don't just accidentally find adultery and just one day figure out, right? So running through a stop sign, innocent things that we do that are wrong, absolutely. You know, doing things, maybe I shouldn't have said that, absolutely. But a lot of these things are deliberate choices of usurping God and placing things in. So these are, these are heavier, yeah. All sin is wrong, don't get me wrong, absolutely right. And so what he's talking about here is that heart that's actually allowing for that and becoming calloused and exchanging and coveting and, you know, the, the, the jesting and the talk and the, the everything that they might have done before, might have, absolutely, but of exchanging that for their purity and their holiness and, yeah, that renewal of their mind and so from that standpoint, just being mindful that they, and, and he very 
clearly says it. If you're doing those things, you'll have no place in the kingdom. And don't be charmed by vain words. Don't be, you know, deceived by those words because of those things. Um, the wrath of God will come upon those of disobedience. And be ye not therefore partakers with them. Now, Mm-hmm. Sure. That's why I say self. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I say you've got to be careful how we affirm ourselves because we can always affirm ourselves in some way, shape, and form. And it's an excuse. But unless we're comparing ourselves to the Word, that's what's going to validate us in the end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And you're grieving the Holy Spirit, and that's the the, the flow from that is that all these things are grievous to the Holy Spirit, whom we are sealed by. So we can't say that and live that and do that and grieve the Holy Spirit and think in some way in our mind that we're just fine, that we're just okay. We're not. Notice what he says. Be in the for not partakers with them. Partakers. Now, how do we partake in that? Absolutely. You're, you're, that's partaking. You're joining in. He's going to use another word that really clarifies it in a moment. But we can't partake in that with them. You can't just go down and party with them. You can't just go down and take part in the um, joking and the coarse jesting and the dirty talk. And uh, As I've mentioned, at work, people know. There's things I'm not going to go do on a Friday night. I'm not going to go down and drink with you. I'm not going to go down and watch dirty movies with you. I'm not going to go down and just there's things that we don't do. And that's the walk that we have. People should know that. Be ye not partakers with them. No, they'll invite you in. As a Christian, they would love for you to participate with them because then they think they're okay. See the slippery slope. Therefore, be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness. Yeah, we all were. Romans 3.23, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all have. We've all been in darkness. But now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Yes. So walk as children of light. How many times has he been saying walk here? Verse 1, walk worthy, he says. And he said it several times, walk as children of light. Again, we can't say one thing and do another. It's either we're walking it and doing it or we're not. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is all goodness, righteousness, and truth. That's what we've been talking about here. Yes, that is. God is what? good. God is good. And God and he is righteous. And he is truth. That's exactly right. And as we're in him, we're to walk as light. It is. It is. And so from that standpoint, we're going to fall like Haley mentioned. Absolutely. First John chapter 1. We're going to have that blood of Christ cleansing us then. But not that we're willfully choosing a lifestyle. Not the, the, the way that the world lives. And we're not participating with them in it. We can't. We're holy. We're separate. We're, we're different. Proving. Now that's a big word. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. 
I went back to Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2 last week. But what does it say? Very similar. Very similar language. Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. A living sacrifice. Holy. Acceptable to God which is our reasonable service. It's the most reasonable thing I can do. If I've got an ounce of common sense in my head, that's the most reasonable thing I can do. I'm dying in my sins. I can have life now for eternity. That's the most reasonable offer I've ever been given. Ever. And be not conformed to this world. Well, some people like to conform, as we're talking about. But be ye transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good, good, and acceptable, and perfect will of God. Very similar thought pattern Paul has here. He just has time here to expand on it instead of verse two verses. Uh, he opens it up here much more broadly and talks about it. Proving what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Now, what is fellowship? We've said the word already. Jointly participating. Jointly participating. Two parties jointly together participating. We can't participate in the world jointly together with what they're doing and be saints and be segregated and be apart from. We can't. They would like for us to. They would like our endorsement because they know our lives are that we're Christians and we're walking a certain walk. They would love for us to say, yeah, you're all good, we're all good, let's just all get along. Well, the reality is that's not the way it's going to be. And the reality is the best thing that we can do is walk our walk and hopefully they'll see those differences and ask questions and we'll have opportunities to help. That's what we pray for. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. What's another word for reproving? Expose them. So darkness, we understand darkness is sin, light. What's light going to do? Yeah. You turn that light on, you can see where you're going. It, it, it helps our vision. We can see very clearly. Darkness does not like, however, Satan's darkness does not like light. It would rather stay in the darkness. We have a holiday we just got done celebrating. Everybody loves to go out at night and, you know, play the roles of different things. Go ahead, Kathy. Yes. No. I know. We can be loving, and that's a different issue. But tolerance of sin, nowhere in the Bible is explained as being what we are experiencing today in our culture, which is, you tell me it's okay, basically. Well, we can't tell them it's okay. You can't live in sin and be okay. The lifestyles of sin are not okay. He's gone through them. It's very clear there's this a very separate line there. Uh, but we do. We live in a, a culture that you know, expects us to say, let's just tolerate one another and just all get along. Well, we can get along, but I'm not going to say that it's okay. That's a different issue, big different issue. For the things that they're doing in verse 12, for it is a shame to even speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Speaking to what you was talking about, their worship, the, the whoremongering, harlotry, pagan worship, you don't even want to talk about it, honestly. If you don't know about it, good for you. you got a pure, innocent mind. Keep it that way. But if you are reading anything about what their pagan worship used to be, it's disgusting. It's filthy. It's, it's pure, unrestrained passions in exchange for the little God worship. But it's really worship of oneself, really. It's not really that little God or both. Uh, for some, it probably is just that one, but others, they might 
Yeah, okay, they may offer something for something else. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. And see then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. What is to walk circumspectly? Mm-hmm. Yep. Very careful, being mindful. It's kind of a mathematical term in a way. A circumference, what is that? 360. Not just being myopic in one direction, just looking right there. You're looking all around, as you say. Being an ER nurse, don't turn your back on anybody. Absolutely. It's 360 degrees looking around, knowing what's around you. Can we live in the world and be not of the world? Absolutely. We live in a world. We do. But we're not of the world. Walking circumspectly is to know that we live in that world. It's a dangerous world. There's things around us all over. We have to walk with full awareness of what's around us. Circumspectly. Not as fools. Not like we was talking about back in verse 4. Not with foolishness, but wise. Redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Time is the most precious commodity we have, period, bar none. We have a lot of things in our lives that we have, but time is the most valuable thing that we have. Nobody in their end wishes, I just wish I could have worked one more day. <laughs> it's not on any tombstones, I'm telling you, none. But I've seen, if I've seen it once, I've seen it a thousand times, people die and wishing they had more time with family, doing what they should have been doing with family, regretting not doing things that they should have been doing with time and their family, redeeming the time, redeeming the time, using the time. Now, I say family, but I've seen a lot of them also wish they were right here right now. Redeeming the time. We're using our time wisely. Wherefore, be not ye unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is probably a good stopping spot because I know I can't possibly make it through verse 19 in five minutes. So we'll, we'll come back to that next week. Yeah, so any points up to verse 17? Yeah, Haley. Mm -hmm. Excuse me? Yeah, it's out of... It is, and, you know, it's, it's out of Isaiah, so I'm not sure the prophecy that he's talking exactly, if he's talking about, you know, as we become Christians now, that Paul's referencing that, walking, you know, from the dead, because we were dead before Christ. Um, I'm, I'm given, probably that's what he's talking about. Um, mm-hmm. It is. Yep. 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 Well, and so, sometimes we, we need that awakening, too. That's true. That from the standpoint, you know, um, it's a lot easier instead of walking, just sleeping and just falling asleep at the helm, if you will. Not knowing direction of our lives. Um, and that's true. They could have actually been just kind of not caring and just going along and uh, now, in, in terms of time I'd like to be, be focus a lot on, on personal time mm -hmm. on a more spiritual basis what is our time going to do with it especially in terms of we were talking about in verse 17 that we should find another goal the primary goal is absolutely the Lord but there's, there's a mission mm -hmm. 
And that's the church on the whole. If you look at the way the church is collectively reaching out, evangelizing, seeking and saving the lost, um, redeeming the time is a very appropriate question. How are we redeeming that time? Um, I think here, you know, not to say that, again, pat us on the back, but we do see that uh, here. And there's other churches that really are struggling with it, and their, their numbers reflect that. But I say that to say this, very true, very good point to look at how are we redeeming the time individually but collectively as a church. Kevin? That's how you break toes. Yep, yep. Good points. I appreciate everybody's 